Exodus, a movement of the people. As we move into the second book of the Tanakh or Old Testament, we have more than a movement of people. We have a flurry of new individuals, ideas, and we see God's miraculous work through ancient Israelite eyes. But how can we be moved? How can we learn to see God's orchestrations and work and become a part of them? We discuss that and much more in today's episode of Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. My name is Joseph Stewart. I'm the public communications specialist at the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. Christian Heal is a research fellow at the Institute, and each week we discuss the week's block of reading from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints Come Follow Me curriculum. We aren't here to present a lesson, but rather to hit on a few key themes from the scripture block so as to help fulfill the Maxwell Institute's mission to inspire and fortify Latter-day Saints in their testimonies of the restored gospel of Jesus Christ and engage the world of religious ideas. Today, we are joined by one of our research assistants, Derek Baker, an ancient Near Eastern studies major emphasizing Greek at BYU from St. George, Utah. After Derek graduates, he plans to become a high school history teacher. Welcome, Derek. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. It is our pleasure. Christian, what is going on in Exodus chapters 1 through 6? So, Some consider the book of Exodus to be the most important book in the Bible. It's certainly a book filled with wonders and terrors. But what makes Exodus so important is that it gives us the master narrative of God rescuing his people and leading them to a promised land. This narrative has shaped Jewish identity for millennia and has inspired oppressed and aspiring people in countless other situations. Exodus also contains a compelling narrative of the making of a prophet, introduces us to the importance of law and the divine economy, and gives us a template for temple worship. The book is easily described in outline. It's the story of the enslavement and liberation of the people of Israel from Egypt, chapters 1 through 15, their journey to Sinai, the end of chapter 15 through 17, the dispensing of covenant and law giving in Sinai, chapter 18 through 24, and finally, the story of the building of the sanctuary and the making of the golden calf, chapters 25 through 40, which deal, as the Jewish study Bible notes, with the authorized and unauthorized way of securing God's presence and worshiping him. As we begin the book of Exodus, we remember that the purpose of Israel's sojourn in Egypt was to make them a great nation. This promise has been fulfilled, and now that the 400 years of exile prophesied by Abraham has finally come to an end, the time to return to the land of Israel has arrived. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is once again alert and at work waiting patiently in the wilderness for someone curious enough to come and investigate a burning bush that does not seem to burn. The book opens with the decline of Israel's status in Egypt, leading to their enslavement. They move from a favoured, or at least tolerated, immigrant community to one that is feared and marginalised. Their fecundity prompted the extreme measures by Pharaoh to control their population growth. Moses arrives in chapter 2 at exactly the wrong time, and his mother is forced to abandon him to save his life. She does, and Moses lives and grows up in Pharaoh's household, seemingly aware of his double heritage. Like Nephi, Moses' journey starts with murder and the necessity to flee for his life. Moses spends years in the wilderness of Midian, getting married, raising a family, and shepherding his father-in-law's flocks, until he is called by God. Moses' reluctance to respond to God's call seems almost comical, but is actually deadly serious. He is caught between God and the seemingly impossible task of leading Israel out of Egypt, and he's terrified by both. Thank you, Christian. Derek, in coming to Exodus, how does it connect to the book that we've been discussing for several months, the book of Genesis? So Exodus being part two of the Pentateuch explicitly links itself to the previous book of Genesis. It repeats in Exodus 1 in shortened form the story of how, why Israelites ended up in Egypt in the first place. It lists the posterity of Jacob as they grow in Egypt, and it says that Jacob's posterity numbers 70, which is a nice round symbolic number for wholeness. The Israelites reap the blessing from Genesis 1 of multiplying and growing strong. The theme of creation is thus present in Exodus from the very beginning of the story. Pharaoh is scared by the growing numbers of the Israelites and enslaves them to try to stem the tide of their population growth. But because they have been blessed by God to multiply, even this does not work. 
It backfires, and the Israelites counterintuitively grow in number while enslaved. Exodus 1, 9-10, in which Pharaoh has the idea to enslave the Israelites, uses similar language to the Tower of Babel story, which essentially goes, come, let us do a thing, otherwise another thing will happen, which is another instance of humanity going head-to-head with God and losing. And in using this language of, come, let us do this thing, it again links itself to the book of Genesis. Moses' mother creates him and then sees that he is, as the KJV reads, goodly or good, and only then hides him from the Egyptians. This is a parallel to God seeing creation was good in Genesis 1. Exodus is thus a new creation, the creation of God's people, primarily through Moses. In Exodus 2.3, it says that Moses was put into a basket, which comes from the Hebrew word teva, which is also the word for ark in the Noah story. The word only appears in these two stories in the Old Testament, and thus the stories are linked as examples of God saving particular people from primordial chaos represented by water. Moses, like Noah, becomes a new founder of a new people. Moses also meets Zipporah at a well, just as the patriarchs Isaac and Jacob met their wives. Moses is equated with the patriarchal figures of Genesis. And finally, the plagues fit into the theme of creation in that God is manipulating the natural world to fulfill his purposes. Pharaoh's magicians can cause chaos, but they cannot restore order like God can. The plagues don't harm the Israelites, only the Egyptians, just as the flood did not harm Noah and his family. Thanks for that really helpful introduction. There's also a reintroduction going on here, Christian, a reintroduction of the idea of God. What do you see going on here? It feels like a great deal of the book of Exodus is dedicated to this reintroduction of Israel to their God. So we have to remember that hundreds of years, 400 years as described, have passed since Jacob arrived with his entire household to the land of Egypt. And we know nothing about Israel's religious condition at this point. We don't know how they worshipped. Do they still know the God of their fathers? Have they maintained their cultural and religious identity? It's not clear because we're not told. But even though we're not told explicitly any answers to these questions, there are hints and tips throughout the book of Exodus that suggest that this book is about the reintroduction of the Lord to his people and the children of Israel to their God. It's a difficult reunion, though. That seems sort of counterintuitive to me. It seems that coming to God after this absence of finding him in a moment of great alarm, as the prophet Joseph Smith might say, would be natural. So why do you think it's difficult? What's going on? Well, we have some sense of this process of introduction from Exodus 3, 13 through 18. At this point in the call of this new prophet, Moses asks God, when I come to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask, what is his name? What should I say to them? So at this point, they don't know the name of God, but it feels like Moses is reintroducing them and having to convince them that this is the God that we worship. Now, they're in a land filled with other gods, filled with Egyptian gods, all with their own names, all with their own attributes. And it seems that Moses fears that Israel's response to his prophetic mandate might be similar to Pharaoh's, who said, who is the Lord? And when we read the Lord there in the KJV and in other versions, what we're reading is the tetragrammaton, the four letters that that are unvocalized in the Hebrew, the sacred name of God, which in some versions are rendered Jehovah, others Yahweh. So who is Yahweh? This God is named. Who is Yahweh that I should heed him? We do not know Yahweh. So this isn't one of our gods. Pharaoh does respond that way, but it feels like Moses is concerned that maybe the Israelites respond that way. So God gives Moses his name, Eye Asher Eye. And as the Jewish Study Bible notes, the meaning of the Hebrew is uncertain. It could be, I am that I am, I am who I am, I will be what I will be. But it has something to do with the kind of the self existence of God. God is introducing himself not as a God of this or a God of that but a God of being itself, a God who is self-existent and exists in the world. I will be what I will be. So God continues, thus shall you say to the Israelites, Eye sent me to you. So as if this were not enough, God then says, thus shall you speak to the Israelites, the Lord, so Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob sent you to me. This shall be my name forever, this my appellation for all eternity. So God has this name which suggests self-existence, 
But then he gives himself a name which links him to the house of Israel and links him to the forefathers of the house of Israel so that they know precisely who he is. Who is this God? Who is the Lord? The Lord is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. When you hear their stories, when you hear their covenants, that's what is going on. So how is Moses received in this context? Because I can only put myself in the shoes of an ancient Israelite and think, if you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, why are we enslaved when they had plenty and they had all these wonderful things and experiences? Where have you been? Not to be blasphemous, but is that one of the questions that's going on for ancient Israelites? The longer journey suggests some acculturation that the Israelites have sort of become comfortable in the land of Egypt. They keep wanting to go back. They fall into idolatry very easily so that there, there isn't a sort of a clear sense of how to worship this God, how to act before him, as it were, how to behave. And so we start to see this giving of commandments as God's way of loving them, this resistance on the one hand. And as their condition gets worse, this combined sense of despair and which develops into need. So yes, I think one of the purposes of these opening chapters of Exodus seems to be to bring Israel to the point where they want God to rescue them. I think that's really wise. And I would just encourage listeners to be thinking about this more in the Alma 32 vein, where people who are humble and who need help will ask for help, will ask for assistance, rather than thinking about this as people will only turn to God in a moment of crisis. I think that it's natural for us to think about oh, well, it's really convenient for people who need God to turn to him. But in reality, we all need God and we can all turn to him. He takes us whenever and wherever we are ready to come to him. It's also interesting that when Moses returns from his journey to Midian, his initial interaction with Pharaoh actually leads to a worse situation for the Israelites. So their only experiences with Moses, at least as attested in the text, are that he kills an Egyptian overseer which does not materially better their situation because there's always another overseer. And then they even get angry at him later on when he tries to interrupt a fight of theirs. And then when he eventually comes back about 40 years later, he just makes their situation worse initially anyway. This was clearly not planned by a PR firm. Thankfully, Moses had a message from God. What did his message center on? The message seems to be in all of this that when we're discouraged and filled with self-doubt, as Moses is, to have hope. When we're too exhausted to even hear God, as the Israelites were at the end of chapter 6, take courage. The Lord God is at work for our good. The Lord is teaching his prophets, asking them the seemingly impossible, and asking of them again if they fail. So the Lord is faithful to his covenants and will always rescue those whom he has taken to be his people. This seems to be part of the message here in these opening chapters. And in all of these actions, God acts in a form of self-revelation. He is making himself known to his people, making himself known to those who worship other gods, to Pharaoh, and ultimately making himself known to the entire world. And what he's making known is that there is none like the Lord their God, none like the God of Israel. So God acts to persuade Israel that he's present in the world, the acts in the midst of the land, and ultimately to persuade them that the Lord is the God of creation and that the earth is the Lord's. This is part of the message that's coming out of these moments, even though it's difficult to hear when things just seem to be getting more problematic. Well, let's think about not only the message, but the messenger here. Now, there were prophets called in the book of Genesis, but Moses' calling seems to be quite different than Adam's or Enoch's or Noah's. What's going on with Moses? We do seem to be introduced to a different kind of prophet here. So the opening of the epistle to the Hebrews reads that long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. And we see this in Genesis, the many and various ways. God walked with his prophets, God visited them as strangers, wrestled with them through the night, visited them in dreams. We also have prophetesses, the wives of the patriarchs, the matriarchs, such as Hagar, who was taught by an, the angel of the Lord and receives covenant blessings, and Rebecca, whose desire to know the cause of her suffering resulted in a prophetic revelation. But here, after 400 years of apparent silence, we don't 
know if God is speaking to his people at this point. God once again calls a prophet, and the call is unique. And once called, Moses becomes, like Joseph Smith, a rough stone rolling, continually taught and refined by God through his successes as much as through his mistakes. At the end of this story, right at the end of the Pentateuch, we sort of get some sense of the Moses that we often imagined. It says that since the death of Moses, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all these signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt, to Pharaoh and all his officials and to the whole land, for no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. And we often view Moses from that perspective, from the end of the story. But Moses was shaped over the course of his life, and that's what makes the story of Exodus and these opening chapters so interesting. As Derek said, it begins with his failure. We sort of think of, we've spoken about Joseph in Egypt, and it felt like Joseph was always successful wherever he went. But Moses is this person who doesn't want to respond, doesn't want to be called, doesn't want to do what God asked him to do, but is continually told and sent and refined in that process. How does Moses end up being called in the first place? He starts out in Pharaoh's household. How does he become a prophet to the ancient Israelites? It seems that what catalyzed Moses' call was a kind of an act of social justice. He sees his people suffering. And like many of the newly woke, his first actions to help don't help at all. And he ends up killing an Egyptian to try and make things better. And when he returns, as Derek said, well, he's met with his suspicion. All he is is another powerful person interfering in the lives of an oppressed people. So his attempts to be an ally fail. This creates, though, a situation in which Moses has to leave. And Moses flees and heads out to Midian. Well, so what happens with Moses before this? Before this instance with the Egyptian that he murders. So we have this gap in the story. We have the child Moses and the kind of the rescuer. And now we have the adult Moses who's going to be sent out to rescue sort of others. We can extrapolate. It seems as though he grew up with his family as well as in an elite household in Egypt, that he's a child of both worlds. He seems to have known the language of his people as well as the language of the Egyptians. He seems to have known Aaron and Miriam. What we don't know is, was this something that was building for Moses, this sense of the plight of his people and their suffering that kind of brought about this action? Or was this the first time he'd seen this? As we know in our own world, it's very easy if you live among the elite to not actually ever see the suffering of the people who sort of provide the things that we enjoy in the world. So what we don't really know, but we can kind of suggest and we can imagine what Moses would have experienced and what his sort of backstory would have been. But we have this encounter. Moses is now a fugitive. So he moves from this high status into a status of being a, a man on the run from Pharaoh for murdering this Egyptian overseer. And now he's out there in Midian, serving as a shepherd for his father-in-law. And now we see another attribute of Moses. So first is this desire to help, this desire to sort of throw himself in, recklessly perhaps. But now we see this other attribute, which is an attribute of curiosity. I love the fact that Moses' call begins with an act of curiosity. What's that? What's going on over there? Right? Most of us kind of pass by things which we could perhaps be curious about in the kind of beautiful natural world around us. We, we kind of live our lives. But Moses is looking out and he goes to explore this bush that is on fire but doesn't seem to burn out in this parched sort of desert that he finds himself in and finding uh, feed for his flocks. Being caught by this sort of lure, as it were, he's called by the Lord. So when the Lord saw that he turned aside to look, that's the moment in which God calls him. It seems like God is looking for someone who is going to take the time to turn and look instead of sort of being focused on their business. And this person, this wannabe social justice warrior, this fugitive on the run, this is the person who God calls and who God makes the greatest prophet, perhaps, in the Bible. 
I think that's vital to understand is that God takes us for what we can be, not who we are in the moment when we turn our face toward him. So how much of Moses's education or the formation of his personality and leadership style do we see in the first six chapters of Genesis? What we see in the opening of Genesis is Moses being self-conscious, self-conscious of his speech impediment, perhaps not confident of going out and speaking. He doesn't want to take this assignment. He keeps asking God to sort of not send him, finding ways to get out of this. God shows him these wonders, turns his staff into a serpent, puts his hand into his cloak and brings it out and it's withered and then heals it. But Moses doesn't seem to kind of get or understand who he's dealing with in the God of Jacob and Isaac and Abraham. It's a curious thing that we have here at the beginning of this story. It also seems to be reluctant to go back to Israel, having caused problems the last time that he was there, and reluctant to go back to Pharaoh. And so this reluctance actually turns out, these fears actually turned out to be founded, entirely founded. Pharaoh does not respond, and he makes things worse for Israel. So at the end of this story, we actually find ourselves at this sort of point in which things couldn't be worse, it feels like. The Israelites are exhausted. Moses is fearful and, I think, concerned at the failure of his project. And God reiterates in that moment that who he is, and he's constantly teaching him about himself. I think that's something that's really relatable about Moses, actually, is that he seems completely terrified of the thing that he's being asked to do. And it seems that all of us want to do these really great things in our lives, and I count myself among them. But sometimes the enormity of a task, and I'm not going before a sovereign and demanding that he release enslaved people, but it can completely just psych me out to think, what is step one? in this enormous process of doing what God has asked me to do. It seems like Moses is thinking that way too. Yeah, precisely. And it seems to be that this space in which the impossible is demanded of a people, in which the odds are stacked against them, is precisely the space in which the God of Israel likes to perform his wonders. It's the moments in which everything seems to be hopeless. God seems to want to fight with five people rather than 5,000. He wants the wood to be really wet before he sends down fire from heaven. He really wants there to be almost no hope before stepping in and showing his marvelous power. Never tell me the odds, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but so Moses has spoken with Pharaoh, and he's demanded the release. And not only does Pharaoh say, of course, I'm not going to release your people, but I'm actually going to punish them for your impudence. What happens next? In this moment, Moses goes back to God and complains. And this is the moment where God says, now you will see. Now you will see. feels like at this moment of the greatest suffering and most desperate despair, when all seems lost, is in fact the time when God prepares himself to redeem his people by power. I think that's a great place for us to end this week. Have a blessed week, y'all. Thank you for listening to Abide, a Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you please rate, review, and subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to this podcast? And follow us on social media at, at BYU Maxwell on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and sign up for our newsletter at mi.byu.edu. Thank you, and have a great week.